So I did totally miss the memo on creative mornings and what this is about. This is my first one. Uh, someone asked me if I wanted to have breakfast with Joel. And I said, sure, Joel sounds like a nice guy. He says, yeah, he's a, you know, he brings together some friends. They have breakfast, good coffee. So that sounds like a good idea. I'll be in DC. It's perfect. If my mom were to know that I'm in the Smithsonian right now with a couple hundred of my closest friends <laughs> to talk about a book, I mean, this is like completely surreal. Made even more surreal, I guess this is my DC moment, when I said, Joel, how long you know, do you want me to talk for? And he said, well, usually we have to be out by like whatever it is. But the government might shut down, so if that's the case, go for as long as you want. <laughs> I was like, All right, so this is how the city works. So first, another big round of applause for Creative Mornings, for Charity, for all the sponsors. Thank you guys for putting this on. <clears throat> I, uh, I don't mean this lightly that this is one of the events I was looking most forward to, particularly given the theme and the time of year and the message of the book. And so if it's okay, I think I'm gonna divert a little bit from, I think we've done like eight events in six cities, we're going to London next week and we'll be in Sydney after that. And there's kind of a script you tell most people, uh, but given the theme and given this audience and what it sounds like, the types of people that come to listen to these programs, I'd love to tell just a little bit more of the personal journey that comes before the book. Um, and we do have our friends from Kramer Books who are, are here. If you want to support the bookstore, check them out. I'll be around afterwards. But mostly I'd like to talk about, about why I wanted to put this in writing. So uh, I am the youngest of six kids. I was born in New York City. My family moved a couple times. And I ended up in Southern California. And when we moved to California, I was 14 years old. And there was one gym that our family happened to join as an as a outlet for exercise. And this gym had squash courts. Does anyone know what squash is here? OK, sweet. Most of the time, it's just me. Um, squash is like racquetball, like tennis, but like the ugly stepsister to tennis. Everyone knows tennis. People don't know racquetball, and they definitely usually don't know squash. So there was probably the only courts within 100 miles that happened to be down the street from where I lived. And I fell in love with the sport for a couple reasons. One, it was an independent sport. And so I thought, you know what, if I can get good enough, no one can stop me. I can play at the highest level. I think there were you know, five to six other players my age west of Greenwich, Connecticut that were playing squash. <laughs> and so I thought, OK, if I, if I can get better, you know, I'll see where this goes. But the other reason I really wanted to play was because about a month after I picked up the sport, the Pro Squash Tour. Raise your hands. Anyone know there's a Pro Squash Tour? <laughs> there, you know you are just kidding now. You are being nice by raising your hand. You, OK. All right. Well, usually that's certainly just me that raises my hand. There is a Pro Squash Tour. And very similar to tennis, you have your big events. And then you have these tiny, long tail events that are a couple thousand dollars, split 32 ways. And because you really, you literally make 30 or $40 a match, if you have a tournament in a community, the community will, will literally take in the players that, that come through. So I signed our parents, or my family, up to host a player. And he was sitting across from me having burgers and fries and, and telling me about this life that he was on that was so adventurous and full of surprises. And he was playing on mountains in Brazil and in towns in Asia. and. Uh, these cities along the Pacific. I'd never lived abroad. I'd never been abroad. I'd never really been outside of the bubble I was in. And so at that point, I thought, you know what? That's what I'll do when I grow up. I'll be this guy. Because he was playing the sport I loved and using it to have this amazing life experience. So 10 years later, I'm sitting at my office desk. I was fortunate to go to, to school. My parents saved up and put me through college. And I felt this enormous weight that said, this is what you should be doing. You know, in, I think, most cultures, and particularly this one, there's like a, a linear staircase you go on, right? If you're lucky to go to college, maybe you get to study abroad or do something crazy like, like drive around the country in an RV, and you use your summertime to do that, but then you get, you get real. And this was a couple years after the crash, and so to me, on paper, this is what I needed to be doing. 
So I was going to work every day. And two things happened that were unfortunate but were realities. Number one, I had this little voice in my head. And it, it reminded me that 10 years earlier, I was supposed to go play squash at some point. And then number two, which was actually more terrifying, was that this voice wouldn't go away. And that I was gonna go into work the same way I walked to work every day, do mostly the same thing for eight to 10 hours. And no one was gonna come in and knock on my door and say, <clears throat> you know, Mike, congrats. Three and a half years, you can go chase your dream. I know you've been thinking about it. Now you can go. I waited, no one was doing that. Two years passed, three years passed. And so five years ago this month, January 13, I'm sitting in my office desk. Everyone went home at work except the person next to me, my buddy Corey. And I literally Googled, when do you chase your dreams? <laughs> if you haven't Googled that, don't. <laughs> it's really weird. You're gonna ask yourself more questions than that. But what came up, I'll summarize it for you. You know, what you get is, is one of two things. On one side of the spectrum, the fluffy, inspirational, motivational quotes, like live your truth, still don't know what that means, but live it, <laughs> go chase your dreams, like follow your passion. And then on the other side, it's kind of like the end result. The photos on Instagram, that post on LinkedIn where you're like, really, you're seriously gonna tell us about that new promotion? Great, I'll like it, but I actually hate it, right? Uh, the photos on, your feed on Facebook and posts on TechCrunch, your friend living in Bali telling you how cool it is they're in Bali. And all that's great, but it seemed like you skip over a lot. And on my desk that night, there was a, a magazine article of a woman who left a job to become a cyclist. And the whole article was on how she made the Olympic team the year prior. And at the very end, it says, before cycling, Evie worked at a corporate job in whatever she was doing. And so being the weirdo that I am, I found her number and I called her that night. <laughs> and her first question was, how did you get my number? And then we spent 30 minutes not talking about how she made the Olympic team, not talking about the next Olympics that she had already qualified for, but going down this path of what I called the, the 10,000 unsexy steps that I wasn't looking at on Facebook, that I couldn't find on my Google search. Because that stuff, like that's the shit that you really need to know if you're gonna go do what you love. And I know there's a lot of creatives in the audience and people that are actually doing that, so I don't need to, to tell you that, but five years ago, I needed proof that this person struggled to tell the, her parents that she wanted to be a cyclist. You know, the tough conversations with friends, the, the days where nothing was working, with money running out, failures and restarts, and, and the insecurities that come with, okay, now I'm doing it, what if it doesn't work? So I hung up the phone and I sketched a cover page. I was not, part of the reason my mom would be surprised I'm here is that I'm actually not a writer, or I wouldn't think of myself as that. Uh, I just was fixed on that story, and I knew that my buddy next to me wanted to take a jump. The person at the bar down the street, the woman next to me on the bus, the receptionist down at work, like we all had something we were thinking about. And this was the first time that a story that had nothing to do with any of us could relate to all of us. And so I turned to Corey and I went in and then, this was literally five years ago, nearly to the day, if not the week. And I was like, this should be a book. But more than that, it should be a community where people can, very similar to this, grab beers, get good food, and like talk about what they really wanna do in a not really weird way. And people can open up and say, yeah, I'm doing this, but I'm thinking of trying this. And I want to learn a new language. I want to volunteer more. I want to maybe quit my job. Maybe it's just something else. But be able to create a space for that. So over the next year and a half, I did my own series of unsexy steps. Um, I joined the Pro Squash Tour part-time. Um, I did not score a point in my first match, which since all of you guys know what squash is, you should know that's really hard to not score a point <laughs> in your first match. But I did it. My dad came down, he was like, are you seriously considering doing this more? Cause like <laughs> the writing's on the wall. Um, but I was. I pitched sponsors using my slide deck. Uh, when I did get to write this book, I, 
the last year and a half has been pulling the personal narrative out of that, which was, was a lot of unsexy steps, a lot of failures. But to speed it up a bit, a year and a half later, I had saved up enough money to go for three months on the pro squash tour. I had gone from 387 in the world, which probably may sound impressive, but it shouldn't because if anyone wanted to, they could sign up and pay $100 and be 388th on the tour. <laughs> like I was the last person. But by playing and showing up for that year and a half while I was working in finance, I said, okay, I'll just see what happens. And I got to 300, and I promised myself I got to 300, I would move to Australia and start playing the squash tour. So a year and a half later, I packed my bags and I saw my buddy Corey and he goes, when's that book coming out? I was like, yeah, book schmook, I'll figure it out later, life's busy, you know, I'm living my truth, you know, like this is what he, <laughs> like, like, come on. And I actually went to New Zealand first and I got to New Zealand on the other side of the world and I had one month planned, budgeted for three months. And you know what happens? I mean, not to be cheesy and quote the alchemist, but when you go for what you want, and I'm sure many in this room have done that, the world conspires and strangers come out of the woodwork and three months turned into four, turned into six, and every single night I was with somebody else. I ended up going for nearly two years. I went across like 300,000 miles. I spent one night in a hotel and for the rest of those two years, I was pulling up stools at a bar or seats at a dinner table and listening to people share what they wanted to do if they had that permission. Sadly, a couple months into the tour, who here remembers the Ice Bucket Challenge? So, thank you. The, my buddy Corey, who I sat next to, was this larger-than-life figure. He started the Ice Bucket Challenge for his friend, who has ALS. Corey passed away at a fundraising event in a tragic accident. And, you know, I was living in Australia and very much alone, thinking about how this, how you face death how you think about life in the face of that. And I messaged his brother and sister. I said, I gotta finish this book. Because the last email I got from Corey was when I left Bain and I was sending that yada yada goodbye, stay in touch, even though no one ends up actually staying in touch, but you say it anyway. And I sent that email and everyone wrote back the same thing except Corey said, you know what, good luck, but I'm expecting that to be a book in a community someday. So get, get started on when to jump. And it was August of 14 when he passed away. And I looked back at the Dropbox folder I had and I had not touched it in 18 months. And you talk about anxiety, that felt not so much like anxiety, but a sense of urgency. And so I said, I'm gonna finish this project and I'm gonna, I'm gonna see it through. So fast forward two years later, I come back to San Francisco. I, I quickly realized there's this a little a hack that we call it. Um, if you're staying on your buddy's couch anywhere in the world, you're called unemployed. <laughs> if you're in San Francisco, you're called an entrepreneur. <laughs> so I was an entrepreneur on my buddy's couch, Crosby, and I had these stories. And I thought, okay, well, I'd already been rejected by most editors in the Western Hemisphere. It's not going to be a book, but I'll, I'll make it a blog. And I go into a, a foundation's dinner party that a friend invited me to. And I'll never forget it, uh, this uninvited guest pulling up a seat at this party that hadn't yet started. I had my backpack from playing on the tour and I, in my backpack I had four years of stories. Again, I promised I wouldn't talk that much about the book. The book is all about like the middle ground. So those four years of stories that I was collecting for no other reason than just to show up and collect them were gonna be something. Sorry for this, there we go. Uh, I go to this party and the woman next to me before it kicks off, she says, you know, what are you doing? Now this had been, I guess, two years since I left my last job. A year and 11 months after my parents were hoping I'd come to my senses and get another job. And I probably had six weeks left, left of money in the bank until it was time to get serious. So instead of telling her what I should have told her, you know, I, I pulled out these stories. And I said, this is this community that I'm gonna make. It's called When to Jump. And we're gonna have jump clubs where it's gonna be the love child of a TED talk, a farmer's market, and a music festival. And you should come. 
And we're going to have a book out someday. But really, it's going to be a blog to start. Because I think a blog makes more sense, which of course means I couldn't do anything else. <laughs> she said, well, have you ever done these stories you know, in video form? This is so powerful. We all have a story to tell. And I said, lady, I'm on my buddy's couch. I got five weeks left. Video is not in the equation right now. She goes, well, if you ever think about video, here's my card. Let me know what you think. Uh, we'd love to work together. I looked down, and it was Ariana Huffington that gave me her card. <laughs> and in the book we talk about this, there's these four phases that I found. I talked to thousands of people around chasing your dreams. I distilled 44 stories in the book, and they're threaded through the same set of themes. Literally, there are four themes that will tell you the phases you're in if you're going after your dream. And the third one is from the author Michael Lewis, the f I called the famous Michael Lewis. I think he only agreed to be in this book because he thought he was, I think he was tickled by the fact that another Michael Lewis had left finance to try to write a book, so he gave me his story. But he talks about letting yourself be lucky. And in my mind, I guess I was, the anxiety was that I'd never see this through, but I turned it from anxiety into a sense of urgency. And then critically, I think you have to have a short-term goal, which was, okay, I'm going to maybe get a job, but I'll have this creative project on the side. And then you also have to have the long-term vision for what this was going to be. So while I think I got very lucky sitting next to Ariana, what wasn't luck was the thousands of dollars and two years I spent making sure these stories would be in my backpack. So when I did run into that, I would let myself have that luck. And three weeks later, I remember Ariana, similar to how Joel said I was having breakfast with friends today, uh, Ariana said, could you come chat with some of my colleagues at HuffPost? I said, sure. So I show up in the same like, you know, outfit that I wore whenever I had a formal meeting on the squash tour, which was like a wrinkled button down. And it was 15 executives of the HuffPost and me on the other side. And the first thing they said is, so is this a brand? <laughs> and so I look back at them, I said, of course it's a brand. <laughs> so obviously it's a brand. And so the meeting ends, and I go back to the elevator, and what do I do? But I Google, how do you make a brand? <laughs> and about a month later, I meet an agent, and she was the first of many attempts where she said, you know, honey, I left my law firm to be an agent 30 years ago. I jumped. My son's about to take his jump. This may never be a book, but it should be a book. And that was the first time I had someone that had some upside in making this work. And that was in early 2016. We launched our brand a few months later. We reached 3 million people in the first two videos with our partnership with HuffPost. And from there, the most exciting thing is not the traction we've had and the book we get to talk about, but we're giving people permission to go do what they love. And if you don't need permission, I actually think that's a good thing. There's a woman in the book, a single parent from Massachusetts who left marketing to go into writing. She's a friend of mine, actually a friend of Joel's. She was up at our event with Corey's Foundation in Boston. We've been really lucky. We've had seven events and seven sellouts in the first week of the book coming out. And the best part is hearing from people about what their jump is and what they want to do and using this as permission. But what she said is, I think, more powerful, which is that at some point, you don't need permission. You need support. And there's a difference between support and permission. And I would go a step further. In the first paragraph of the book, I talk about a, the last conversation I had with my buddy um, who was a big advocate for this. And he said, he said, good luck. You know, I was, I was off to tell my job I was quitting. It was the end of the kind of planning. It was time to go. And he said, you know, this isn't going to be easy. I said, is this crazy? And this, he was older than me, this, this mentor of mine, he turned around and he said, you know, what you have in mind is crazy, but there's a difference between crazy and stupid. And so I think that's the theme of what we're getting at. That's what our platform's about. That's what our community's about. We're giving people that ability to not just say, I need permission, but to say, I have support from others. And doing it in an authentic way, you know, I don't believe this, hopefully it is helpful to people, but I think of it less as prescription and more of a space. And if you plan and you go through these 10,000 unsexy steps, the phases we talk about in the book and the mantras we, we kind of share in our community, I think that yes, there is a massive crazy decision you have to come to in your life. Sounds like many of you have already 
have made that or you're thinking about it. But there's a difference between crazy and stupid. And if you plan right, a jump's always going to be crazy, but it's actually not going to be stupid. And the outcome will never be one that you actually care about. The process is what matters. A few months after we launched, Airbnb um, offered to partner with our brand. And I said, sure, I guess that's what you do. If you're a brand, you partner with other brands. And it turns out 25% of Airbnb hosts have used the money they make to go change their life. And so the first part of our collaboration was to, to talk to some of their guests and hosts about what it is they wanted to jump to. And I'll never forget it. It was in downtown LA, two months into being this new startup brand that I incorporated on my buddy's couch. And my parents came and brought some of our extended family because they were pretty sure that they may be the only ones in the audience that day. And so they're sitting there and the doors open and we had 2,500 people come in. And at the end of my slideshow, because of course I had to have slides, I had to have a platform to talk about, I gave this email address. And I said, if you have a jump for next year, send it into our platform, which is me. <laughs> and our platform will really keep you on it. Five minutes after the event ended, I checked my email. We had 600, 650 emails come in in five minutes. And almost all of them had nothing to do with, with changing your job and living your passion. The people we heard from were, were baby boomers in Detroit, uh, a mother of four in Minneapolis, um, a millennial first generation immigrant in Toledo. And what they wanted their jump to be was to create agency and to have that agency so that they can decide what happens in their life. So the jumps they wrote in were not, I gotta go move to Bali. It was like, I wanna write more on the weekends. I wanna see my family more after work. I wanna be a mom and have a career. And suddenly this idea of when to jump became much more than just a yuppie millennial being like, I gotta play this random sport. This became more about how do you control what your days look like? How do you live a life that you feel is meaningful? Super funny side note to that story is that I got a lot of feedback from, from the folks who participated from Airbnb and the most common piece of feedback was, geez, you know, your platform, the AI must be so sophisticated that it's like we're talking to a human on the other side. And that was, three days of me being like, next email, next email, get through my 600 left, 500 left. But we were there. And so today, if I was to leave you with anything, again, is, is how do you spend your time? There's a story in the book of a fitness entrepreneur who left being a designer and an engineer to start a gym. And he says, show me how you spend your time and I'll show you what your priorities are. And so we do these events and we, we talk about the book and there's a lot of great stories in there, but there's a lot of stories of just taking baby, tiny, little steps. I think that's what this is about. I don't have the answers. We're just building the stage. Uh, we've been fortunate to have the opportunity to tell this message, but the message champions, you know, the 44 people in the book who you'd walk by on the street or take the metro with who have taken that agency. And so I don't, I don't love the question of like, what should I go do with my life? Or when do I chase my dreams? And I think that's something we get a lot of in the echo chamber these days. And you see it you know, everywhere you look. You know, this is about saying, do what you love. It's gonna be really effing hard. You're not alone in deciding to do it. And hopefully we've created a stage where you can share that with others. So uh, if you get the book, I'll be here, I'm here to sign, and, and, and I'd love to hear your stories. We have a podcast that comes out every Tuesday. Uh, who here listens to the podcast? Is anybody? Oh, nice, hell yeah, that's great. Uh, my mom was the host last week, just to be like, for fun, email info at whentojump.com and be like, love the podcast, your mom should be more regularly featured. Because we had a discussion this morning, she's like, you know, I've been viewed more times than your interview with Cheryl on the podcast. I said, Mom, maybe we should do a Mike and Mom segment. She's like, we'll see what people think this morning at your breakfast. So <laughs> info at when to jump. Be like, loved it. Get your mom on more. I'll forward. I'll be like, I don't know what's happening, Mom. Um, 
Every Tuesday, we have that coming out. We've got a newsletter once a month. We have a festival that we started in San Francisco, went to New York last year. We'll be in London this, this fall. If you go to the website, you can sign up for the newsletter. We'll keep you posted. Uh, we're on social, and we share these stories of re regular, everyday people once a week, and we'll keep doing it as long as we can. Um, but more than anything, I hope you found this interesting. I appreciate you spending your time with me this morning. I would love to support Kramer Books and get these books out. Obviously, selfishly, I'd love people to read this book, so that helps both of us. Uh, but truly, I think local bookstores is where it's at. So thank you, Creative Mornings. Thank you all for joining. I hope to see you guys.